Well, welcome to the podcast, Francesca. Thank you very much for having me on. No, we got there eventually. I'm sorry I uh, messed you around a little bit today with it, but we got here in the end. That's all good. It's good uh, to so we'll start with kind of the beginning of it all like what made you want to set up love the oceans oh how far back do you want me to go um <laughs> uh so um okay right so i i um, i've always been obsessed with sharks like ever since i was a kid um I was, everyone is surely yeah i mean my email address <laughs> i got teased for it at school and my email address was sharks are the coolest dudes when I was 13. Fair um, play, fair play. Yeah, uh, it's quite funny. Um, but yeah, so I've always been obsessed with sharks and I learned to dive when I was 13 and my mum took me to the London Aquarium for my eighth birthday. So it was always kind of like something that was in my like periphery. Like I was always kind of like watching documentaries and it was part of my life. Um, like David Attenborough and Jack Stowe and all that kind of stuff. Um, and then I, when it came to university, um, I went to, I studied marine biology because I knew I wanted to do something underwater. And I, to be honest, I didn't really read that much into it. I just thought marine biology. <laughs> yeah. Fair so, enough. I uh, went to university of Southampton and did that. And then at the end of my second year, I um, took an internship in Mozambique uh, photography. So completely unrelated. Um, uh, but when I was there, obviously I was studying marine biology at the time when I was there, I saw my first um, shark killing um, and that was quite emotional, um, seeing these sharks killed in front of me. Obviously I'd like read quite a lot about the shark fin trade and it was something I was interested in and watched documentaries and all the rest of it, but it's quite different to like seeing it in real life. Um, so I wanted to work out why the sharks are being killed and like what kind of scale we were talking about, because yeah, it's really sad if that one shark was being killed but like if that's happening through like every single day and it's like multiple sharks then you're kind of looking more at an um, ecological problem rather than just a sad like one-off kind of thing. So I um, found out that it was for the shark fin trade so the um, the fishermen were catching the sharks for their fins to sell the fins um, for the shark fin trade which is obviously for shark fin soup um, and then I uh, went back to university and I was doing an integrated master's at the time so I went back into my third year found a supervisor and three research assistants um, and I then um, uh, basically came back out to Mozambique in the summer of my third year before my fourth year because it was an integrated master's so I didn't have to reapply so I collected the data for my master's dissertation in the summer of my third year with those research assistants and I was writing up my dissertation I was getting the exact results you would think in terms of the shark fin trade so it's not sustainable um, like possible detrimental effect for the local marine ecosystem so I wanted to um, continue my research uh, it wasn't something I could feel like, because I didn't have enough data to publish um, a paper and le uh, like lobby for legislation change at all. So um, I felt like I needed to collect more data and it wasn't something I could walk away from and live the rest of my life and like, you know, just continue. So I started the organization initially just to continue my shark fisheries research. But the more I read into successful conservation strategies and like what's worked for people, what hasn't worked for people, then um, that's kind of when the rest of the organisation was born. Um, so, yeah, it didn't all come about at once. It's been like a slow growth, but uh, it's, um, yeah, been quite a journey. Yeah, <laughs> and, it sounds it. Yeah, I mean, now I'm 27 and uh, I started it when I was 21. So it's been going a while now um, and it's been a very steep learning curve <laughs> I bet yeah they don't really do a manual for it do they so you just got to kind of crack on it's a learn as you go like um and you learn like I definitely learned from my errors but also other people's errors as well because there are a lot of different organizations sorry my dog I'm a squeaky toy I'm just gonna go. <laughs> I did wonder what that noise was I was thinking what's going on Sorry, I'm hoping you can just cut that bit out. <laughs> I was I was more worried that you were squeaking. I was trying to think that's not normal. Like, you shouldn't be squeaking. Um, <laughs> a fun squeaky toy, and then was like, "Oh, this is a fun game." 
dogs have that habit, don't they? If there's one thing they could do to annoy you, they'll uh, they'll find it. You, you you mentioned sharks. What kind of sharks uh, were, were they finning? Um, so basically anything that could be caught. So um, that particular fishery that I was looking at right at the start, that was netting. So it wasn't actually a targeted shark fisheries. Um, there is a targeted shark fisheries that we work with now, um, but I mean, it's still like whatever species are caught, yeah. uh, like the fins of soles. So largely, it started off largely scalloped hammerheads, but we actually saw species assemblage when the catch change over time um, because of overfishing, or at least that's a theory. Um, so it's kind of gone from majority scalloped hammerheads to more like full sharks. Um, and I mean, like we've seen pretty much, and small tigers and stuff, we've seen pretty much like every type of shark that's in the area. <laughs> so yeah. Like, so there's like, no there's no targeting then. It's just whatever comes out. So it's whoosh, yeah, off you go. Yeah, yeah. And I, I, my next question was going to be why Mozambique, but I'm guessing it's purely because you've had that experience there that you went to. It wasn't like we're going to do Love the Oceans. Let's pick Mozambique. It's because you'd already been there and you had that experience. I assume. Yeah, it was it was that there was the existing relationship with people that I knew there. Um, and then on top of that, like the specific area that we work in, Jangamo Bay, is very um, typical of the Mozambique coastline. So the issues that we're facing in our area are going to be representative of a lot of the other areas in Mozambique. So the idea, like the vision of Love the Oceans, is creating a successful conservation strategy that can be replicated through other um, similar areas. Um, and that will probably largely be up and down the Mozambique coastline. Right. And you mentioned that you're working uh, with, with the locals there. Was there much scepticism when you started? Because presumably they're like, who is this person? Why, why are you telling us how to fish? You know, or, or, or were they on board for it? Yeah, so I was really lucky. Um, I met Pascal, who's our community outreach manager, almost immediately. He was the brother of um, a friend of mine. And he's just like amazing. He does so many different jobs and he's um, like just a natural born like communicator. So he speaks the Tonga, which is the local dialect, um, Portuguese, which is the national dialect, and English, um, which is my dialect. <laughs> um, and um, he uh, had loads of input and still does, obviously. Um, and uh, it was it was pretty easy. Like the, so, I'm obviously foreign, and there definitely has to be um, no like parachute science, and like you have to be respectful of who like the culture like who you're talking to um and i also know that like i'm white and historically there is a terrible reputation of white people in africa courtesy of colonialism and apartheid south africa and things like that going on um so there's also like that kind of like um barrier and trust issues that you that i think you can only like talk like you can talk about that right so it's just a matter of talking about that and like discussing different cultures and things like that and um the Jankama community is like amazing like everyone's just just nice and like willing to communicate essentially um and just open so we've always had like a very respectful relationship uh where because obviously also to, to have a successful conservation strategy you need the input from the people that you're working with yeah from a, yeah you know from a pure science perspective it makes absolutely no sense to not have an, an efficient model model as possible. So if you're ignoring the users in the strategy, then you're like, that's not going to be the most successful strategy you can develop. So from a pure science perspective as well, it just makes sense to include everyone. I guess um, it's not going to work either, is it? Like if they're not on board and they don't want to help you, then it's going to make you, your job 10 times harder. Yeah, I mean, there is different types of like conservationists around the world and different ways that people do things. But for us, it's um, the community led approach is a really essential part of what we do. And we kind of um, the way we picture it is that we're so with the with the marine protected area creation around the world, we usually have like an NGO partner in that marine protected area. But the initiative is being led by the people on the ground and the people whose resources it is like it, it's Mozambique's resources. Um, and that's kind of how we picture Love the Oceans. We're just the NGO partner providing and helping where we can, but uh, it is largely locally led. Um, and that I think is a really important aspect. Also, we were just lucky because back when, because obviously it wasn't born like it is now, it didn't start like that. It was just kind of more like ping pong of ideas. And then that's how things grew and projects developed. 
um and when I first had like with Pascal when we first had our first community meeting um I didn't realize it at the time because I was 21 and had no idea how to run a business but essentially what I was doing was a needs assessment so I was working out what was the priority essentially um and I think one of the most important things in this kind of work is listening and making sure that you're not like making assumptions or anything like that so um when we were talking about all of this kind of stuff I kind of floated the idea of a marine conservation initiative and something that utilized the marine resources in a sustainable manner and tried to transition away from unsustainable practices and things like that and um, I was just really lucky because Mario who's the Pandani elder had been to Kenya and seen a similar marine initiative there so I literally just mentioned the beginning of it and he was like oh my gosh yeah 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 let's do that here like that's gonna be really successful like we can generate revenue in a sustainable manner and it's going to benefit the oceans the humans and we don't have to like worry basically um so yes we're interested in that kind of thing and so that was pretty a pretty easy transition we've struggled more with the expat community there's a lot of foreign owned business in Mozambique um and that's definitely been more tricky um but we're getting there slowly but surely it's yeah. um it's a step-by-step -step process and conservation science unfortunately is notoriously slow moving um and data sets are better to have the longer the data set the more data you've got the stronger your argument is so it's um it's a difficult one because you want to fix it all right now but then you've also got to like have a strong <laughs> strong argument yeah improve. yeah of course you have and and since you've kind of started this partnership with the local community what kind of benefits have you seen because presumably things are going to be getting better in terms of uh, more sustainable practices yeah, so it's obviously quite slow going. We are only six years old now, so we are still young in terms of conservation science, science making change. But probably the project that I would say, well, I mean, apart from the like really obvious number kind of outputs in terms of like our education, like 1,500 kids are free access to education now, 1,250 have been taught the basics about the oceans, over 800 kids have had um swimming lessons that kind of like numbers but in terms of like actual like cultural shifts and changes and stuff like that um i think are probably are the most interesting projects i like to talk about because it's something that i'm hopefully going to do my phd on is our sustainable fishing project so this project is run in conjunction with gemo who's the chief fisherman so the way that like the organization we say we're based in Changamo Bay and Changamo Bay is actually three different communities within that so you have coconut community, Ginjata community and Pandani community and we predominantly work in Ginjata and Pandani just because they're close proximity, coconut's a little bit further off um, but within each community so you have the overall Changamo chief who signs off on like work and stuff like that but isn't, in, isn't involved in a day-to-day -day basis but you then have the um, elders of each community. So that's the community leaders of those communities. Um, so they're kind of like the top rung in like that community. And then below them, you have a chief for each um, industry. So you have a chief for like agriculture, a chief for education, a chief for fisheries um, and loads of different stuff. So Jemo is the chief of fisheries in the Ginjata community. And this project we're starting in the Gajata, we've started in the Gajata community with the idea to scale it up, but Jeremy was open to kind of like the pilot study essentially. Um, so if you look back at our data over the past six years for our fisheries, four years for our coral reefs, our data shows for our coral reefs that there's massive imbalance between herbivores and carnivores in our ecosystem. Um, so there's uh, way, way, way more carnivores and barely any herbivores left. And herbivores are really important because they maintain reef health. They graze on algae. Algae competes with coral. If they don't graze on algae, the algae booms, the coral dies off, and then you end up with coral reefs dying off, um, which ultimately, like, without listing off the thousands of reasons that coral reefs are really important, one of the major ones is that they're a nursery ground for important fish species. So that's commercially important, but also locally important to feed humans. So if we have the collapse in nurseries, then the fish populations collapse and humans starve essentially. So it's like bad news for everyone. Um, so uh, that's like what our coral reef data shows. And then if you cross reference that with our fisheries data, so our fisheries data over the last six years, we've basically been looking at um, uh different types of fishing and the like 
sustainability of different types of fishing and that kind of sustainability is assessed through the different species that are caught and the sizes of different species as well. Um, and so our research has shown that gill netting is the least sustainable, which no surprise there. Yeah, yeah. Catch <laughs> is caught through nets. Um, and the other one that I wasn't expecting at all was spearfishing in our area is considered unsustainable if you're looking at the exact balances of herbivores versus carnivores and the type of fish that are caught. So that is largely because um, the, so we have very strong riptides in our bay, uh, very strong um, riptides and undercurrents and the sea is not a great place to learn to swim in our area. So we have our free swimming initiative um, but when you spearfish, because generally spearfishing is like universally accepted as a very sustainable method of fishing because there's no bycatch and you're not going to accidentally shoot a whale shark kind of thing. Um, and, It'd have to be um, very bad to do that. Yeah. And I, I, <laughs> I guess this kind of comes back to like definitely being open to things because like when I thought about this whole project, because this this whole project was something we thought of and was on our strategy document. We have a 10 year strategy document, but we weren't gonna implement it for a few years. And then with COVID and stuff, which I'll go into in a minute, we decided to bump up the timeline. And in my head, I always thought we'd want to move people away from gill netting towards spearfishing because it's just like acknowledged that spearfishing is like sustainable. So that was like in my head, but actually according to our data, because um, the of the currents in our bay and because people can't afford boats to go out and spearfish from people are swimming out to spearfish and because of the currents they're limited to very local reefs so and the and the fish populations that are on local reefs happen to be a lot of herbivorous residential fish um, versus if you were spearfishing in like pelagic water kind of thing um, so what we've seen is actually mass amount of herbivores caught through spearfishing and gill netting. So really we want to transition people away from these types of fishing towards the most sustainable type of fishing that our research has shown, which is kayak fishing. Um, and kayak fishing, obviously you're on a boat, so you're further out to sea, um, you're fishing with a rod and line, so you're not getting bycatch. Um, it's just a more like sustainable way of fishing because you're further out to sea, you're getting more pelagic fish and you're generally going to be targeting um, your carnivores and our data shows that with literally no education around like which fish are good to catch and which fish are bad to catch just out of the like type of fishing that it is kayak fishing happens to get the most herbivores uh, sorry the most carnivores yeah so that's your tuna and your barracudas and things like that so um so really we want to be transitioning people away from the spearfishing, the netting towards the kayak fishing. Um, and so we were talking with Gemma about all of this stuff and what what kind of, and with the fishermen um, community, the fishing community in Injata as well, about like what trends they'd seen in their own catches and whether they'd noticed certain species like not being present anymore and things like that. Um, and everyone kind of agreed that herbivore was about to catch, but how do we, get around this like what is the solution here like people still go and feed their families we're a coastal community you can't tell people that they can't eat fish anymore especially during covid like yeah happened and in our area you've got about a 70 percent unemployment rate so only about 30 percent of the population is employed the other 70 percent is largely reliant on subsistence fisheries and farming so that 30 percent yes they support a lot of the 70 percent through their own like wages and family and you know you look after your loved ones but that 30% is largely employed through tourism. So um, COVID happened and tourism in Mozambique dropped by 95% because Mozambique locked its borders from March to October in 2020, reopened and then locked again um, with the second wave. So tourism just took a nosedive, which meant the 30% that was employed now don't have an income. And so more people became reliant on the seas as a source of food and income. So we saw an increase in net use because netting is one of the easiest ways of fishing because you just leave the net in the water and then come back and hopefully it's got some fish in it. So that's the reason we bumped the project up on the timeline because we were like, it would be good to have a solution that can benefit humans and enable humans to feed their families and survive this pandemic, but also not completely ruin the oceans at the same time. So, yeah, uh, it's a hard balance, isn't it? Because like you say, you want to help the conservation, but at the end of the day, people have to eat, you know, in, 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 in unusual circumstances, admittedly. So um, it's, it's a tricky one, isn't it? Definitely. 
Uh, yeah. You you mentioned a little bit about the the rip tides in there, and I know you're you're an underwater photographer as well. And I just wondered if you found that useful for the charity because you know media is so important for getting the message across. So I, I had a look on the website earlier, and and you know it's very well designed. Photography is fantastic. So do you think that makes a difference? Oh, hugely. Um... So I, yeah, I'm basically only underwater, like I'm rubbish at terrestrial stuff. <laughs> Not give me a camera on land. Um, and so uh, I, that's useful in terms of like our Instagram and, and having content that's very underwater focused. And if we're focusing on a specific species in that sense as well. Um, but we're actually partnered with an organization called Photographers Without Borders. Um, I don't know if you've heard of them, but they're... I saw on the website, I'll be honest with you, I hadn't heard of them before, but no, feel free to enlighten me. So they're, I'm going to really try not to fangirl too hard because like they're amazing. Um, <laughs> but um, Danielle De Silva set it up and we kind of met and bonded initially on being like young women starting organisations because she was 22 when she started Photographers Without Borders and I was 21 when I started Love the Oceans. Um, and they basically exist because there's this gap between like charities needing good content to be able to run campaigns to be able to make a difference and being able to afford those incredible videographers and yeah. that create that content. Um, so it's like this, how do you get the money to be able to employ the people to, to be able to generate the revenue? Um, and so she started Photographers Without Borders to connect grassroots organizations with these insane um, photographers and content creators. So she connected us, the first guy she connected us with, um, which is so nuts. Like he was Blue Planet, like he was Blue Planet videographer and he came out and he filmed for free our first um ever promo vid which we still use now and it's beautifully shot and like then they came out again and filmed a documentary on us for their um series that they run and they create essentially pretty much all of our content and their big thing is about telling a story with photos which is so integral to the work that like ngos do um like pretty photos are nice but if there's no story to it then it's kind of like not pointless but no i know i know what you mean yeah <laughs> um so um for us yeah having that content is like such an important part of us being able to communicate our journey and the people involved and we've been partnered with them for a while now like they started working with us in 2016 so now over the years we've also got like a little nice little time log of the kids that we work with growing up and like moving so we've got like Benton and Mario who are two of our we call them ocean conservation champions but they're essentially interns um, and they've kind of progressed through our swimming lessons from beginner to intermediate to advanced. And then they go from swimming lessons into the OCC program. And they're currently doing their like diving qualifications, swimming qualifications, English and stuff like that. Um, but we've got them kind of like going through the program in like really good <laughs> like photography. It's not like rubbish photography. It's like great photos. Um, so there's also like all these other splinter stories that kind of happen as a result. Um, so for us, it's been an absolute godsend being partnered with them. Um, so if any NGOs listen to this podcast, then look them up because they're amazing. But uh, yeah, definitely it's useful. No, it, it, it definitely makes a difference. I look at, um, I won't name any, but I look at some NGOs and the photography's, uh, for lack of a better word, shite. And it does make a, a huge difference to have that quality. Uh, and, and myself being a photographer, then... Um, you know, it's important to, for them to get something out of it, whether it's money or, or an amazing experience or whatever. So no, that sounds really interesting with what those uh, those guys are doing. I'm going to end on this last one, which is, do you think something like you're doing in Mozambique could work in the UK? I know circumstances are vastly different, but in, in the concept of, because um, what you've done, is it, it? it's not a marine conservation zone or is it, it's a similar concept, isn't it? Is that right with yeah, Mozambique? Yeah, so... As far as I'm aware in the UK, I think there might be one in SCOMA, but apart from that, we've not got many, uh, which sounds quite strange. Do you think something like that could work in the UK or we should have more like that in the UK? Yeah, I think community-led approaches are the key to successful conservation, but there's a lot of hard graft that goes into it. It's a long process. It requires community buy-in, like you need people that trust relationship. Um, you need everyone to participate and everyone to like be on board um and it's a lengthy process and it's also fairly money consuming like it seems like it's not but it really is over a long period of time um 
so we're, although I mean I mean I say that it's money consuming in in my head because I'm like used to working on zero budget but for a government I'm sure it's very cheap um, <laughs> but um, I think yes I think community managed conservation zones just it just makes the most sense because like for us we work in a country where the government doesn't have the resources to shell out loads of money to have patrol people and patrol vessels and rangers and all that kind of stuff so if the community is doing all that stuff themselves and it's protecting their own assets and that's why they're doing it because they're protecting their own source of income then you've just solved one of the human resources problem and and money financial problems with um protected areas so to me yes it could i think the population in the uk is a bit more transient is that the word like people move different places all the time yeah Um, so you potentially have like a lot of turnover of people and trying to get people involved whereas in our area people don't really move around that much um but i think it would still definitely I, I think that it should be a thing that is... I'm probably, yeah, preaching to the converted, really, aren't I? You're hardly going to be like, oh, no, it's a terrible idea. Don't do that. <laughs> but um, Definitely some more obstacles in the UK, but yeah. I think it's, I think it would be worth, I think it would be worth looking at and, like, potentially implementing some test zones or something. Well, I know, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm probably going to vastly oversimplify this, but I, I think with the SCOMA one, and presumably the same in Mozambique, is where you've got this zone where there's no fishing, and that's like a safe zone and a nursery or whatever for the fish and, and other animals to breed. And then you end up getting more in the surrounding areas because they spill out. Whereas obviously yeah. if you fish everywhere, everywhere is depleted. Whereas if you've got these little buffer zones, then it's beneficial for everything. Is that yeah. right? Or am I making that up? Yeah, yeah. So okay. the, the kind of like structure that we would use, I'm working on the MPA proposal at the moment, so this is very well timed. The structure that we're proposing for the marine protected area isn't a no kick zone for the entire area so it's a mixture of different types of zoning um yes some no take zones will be essential um to enable like restoration essentially but um we're not aiming to stop people fish because we're in a coastal area and that's just not realistic what we're trying to do is transition people away from unsustainable fishing and so the projects like our sustainable fishing project the reason that we run projects like that is because the law, what we want to do with our research is changing the law on what types of fishing is allowed. So gill netting, for instance, would ideally be outlawed. But with the Sustainable Fishing Project, Gemo thinks that we can get complete net elimination in the area through that project, which means it doesn't matter if the law changes, we're already abiding by it. So that's kind of like, because we don't want people to be forced into something or forced to do illegal stuff, because that's essentially what it is. It's, they're just trying to live, right? Like they're not doing it because like no one w- wakes up in the morning and goes I'm gonna ruin the oceans today like <laughs> that's not why they're doing that like activity it's because they don't have another option so really our work is about identifying barriers that can stand in people's way of living more sustainably and then working with people to remove them um so it's more of a like holistic approach to conservation that we now take these days yeah I think I think everything you're doing is absolutely fantastic and I've got a tremendous amount of respect for the hard work that you kind of do with that so you know power power to you for doing it it's absolutely fantastic and it's been it's been great to chat to you as well I mean I say I've been talking to Sarah she recommended you ages ago and I've been meaning to get in touch with you for a long time I've only just got got around to doing it but um she mentioned about a scorpion as well something like a near-death experience (laughs) which you probably don't want to relive but I'll bring it up anyway is some some scorpion gave you a little tickle didn't it yeah, we, gave, we uh, have a lot of creepy crawlies, unsurprisingly, in the bush. Um, and uh, we're based in a very rural area. So I was on the phone to Sarah, I think, when it happened. And I just got out of bed to go for a wee and stepped uh, barefoot. I never, I'm never barefoot now. Now I'm like, my shoes are glued to my feet. I will never take them off. Um, but I got out of bed, stepped on a scorpion and, um, yeah, got stung. Thought it was a, thought it was a, um, an ant like a red ant like a really big red ant because we do have really big ants um but then I sprayed some bug spray under my bed which is where it ran off to and then swept everything out from underneath my bed and saw this little scorpion I was like that's not good because the small ones are the ones that inject all their venom because they don't know how much to use so um and then it also had a thick tail which is the telltale sign that it's not a safe one yeah Um, yeah I've heard that yeah, so small, small pincers, big tail. The, the stinger is their defense. Big pincers, small tail. The pincers in their defense. So then, um, 
yeah, I rung my friend. We ended up going to hospital and the so the pins and needles are spread up to my thigh at that point. And the woman was like, you're really lucky because it didn't actually inject venom. And oh. Venom, apparently I would have had to have, likely would have had to have my foot amputated. Um, Jesus. Pretty glad that it didn't do yeah, that. Yeah, I bet. Yeah. Oh, God. <laughs> well, on that cheery note, I'll... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> potential amputee foot i'll end it look it's been a pleasure talking to you francesca thanks for joining me no worries thanks very much for having me